Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Connections with myself, Cameron Bunch, and my father, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch. Last week, we talked about when life is on overload. Um, and uh, the so the episode before that was on life balance, and then we went on uh, what life is like on overload. And this week, we're taking a uh, not too far of a different uh, change, I don't think. Uh, it's going to be different subject matter, but it's still in that same vein, uh, realistically. We're going to be kind of talking about sustainability. Um, my dad and I were talking about beforehand, what should we talk about? And we threw out a bunch of different ideas, and still none of them were quite hitting. And then I was walking with my wife and talking with her. I'm like, what would people care to hear about? And she's like, well, what really happened with the revival that the church was all clamoring about a little bit ago? And I was joking with her and I told you beforehand, it's kind of like the entire church body like went to summer camp and had the summer camp high. And all of a sudden now it's just everyone came back and they're like, well, yeah, well, we got to go back to school, back to work. And uh, and they're all kind of like mumbling. And it's like, well, what happened to that passion? What happened to um, that excitement that was there? And so we just kind of wanted to talk about tonight going into uh, this episode's podcast on sustainability. Um, what happens when emotions run high? Can they continue to run high? Can you run a church and ministry on passion and excitement? Can that be uh, sustained? Does it eventually have to teeter out? Um, are there ways to prolong it? Is it good to prolong it? Or is it better to find routine? And we're just going to dive into this whole subject matter. So let's open up the floor. Yeah. And we're really talking about, was it March? I guess it was when the Asbury Revival in Asbury, in, well, not in Asbury, Kentucky, it's Asbury University in Kentucky. I forget the exact town. And then, of course, on the heels of that was a Jesus Revolution movie, which um, was wonderful. I loved both experiences. I mean, from I didn't go to Asbury, but I, I appreciate what happened there. Genuine, authentic move of God, obviously. For those who, you know, it's amazing, Cameron, you and I saw people criticizing this thing, even um, some YouTubers going there to purposely try to denigrate what God was doing and trying to make it something that, you know, it wasn't. Um, but it was a good, just organic move of God among a group of young people seeking the Lord and God visited them. And many people came in from different parts of the country to get a touch and experience. Different people walked away. And I found Cameron, I think people will get out of something, what they put into it. If they go there looking to be suspicious and critical, they'll come away with a critical spirit and be suspicious. And if they come there hungry for heaven, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get God because, you know, you get what you ask for, you know, asking you shall receive. And I think there's a real principle there. Um, you, we've all had this experience. If you haven't, you need to find a church where you can have this kind of experience where you go hungry and, you know, every expectation is met. You experience the power of God, you know, the, the teaching is dynamic, but I've seen Cameron, two people go to the same meeting and one person will say, oh man, you should have been there. I can't believe you missed that meeting. It was amazing. It was wonderful. You ask somebody else is like, that's all right. They just taught the word. And and because of expectations, because of a failure to really enter in and appropriate what God was doing, people have sometimes different perspectives on things. And so what we're really talking about, okay, is what happens when some momentum is created? Momentum is notoriously difficult to sustain, whether we're talking about business, whether we're talking about sports motivation. Um, you know, I'm a sports fan. And so for those who don't know, I'm a big fan of the Golden State Warriors. They just had this great seven game series against, you know, the team in your area, Cameron, the Sacramento Kings. And they came out, you know, squeaking out a pretty dominant win in game seven, but it was a very difficult season. And then what happens? They run into the Los Angeles Lakers um, last night and get polaxed. I mean, not really, it was a close game, but really for the most part, the Lakers pretty much handled golden state in this first of seven or first of four wins, but first for, you know, four out of seven games. So it's hard to maintain that, you know, you can get all excited, but you know, we're, we're just not built to sustain a high level of octane all the time. You know, that's why, you know, we get up, we have a certain amount of energy in the morning, right? We go through the day, we begin to uh, use that energy up by the time we get to the evening. What do we need? We need rest and recuperation. And, you know, the Bible talks about seasons of recovery, Cameron, or and one translation calls them seasons of recovery of breath or seasons of refreshing. I'm sorry. They come from the presence of the Lord. And the church needs to be refreshed from time to time. So I think that in itself tells me that God understands how he made us and that we are not going to run on a high level of motivation. I'm just excited, full of life and happy every single moment. That's not even realistic. And for people who say, well, that's a lack of faith, brother, you just haven't lived long enough in the earth. Jesus said, in this world, you'll show how you're going to have tribulation. 
be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, but you're going to go through some stuff. You're going to have your ups and downs. You're going to have mountaintop experiences and valleys. But the fact of the matter is that doesn't mean we have to lose. It doesn't mean we have to regress. It doesn't mean we have to be defeated just because our feelings are not, you know, at that fever pitch that sometimes they are when we're having a genuine experience of refreshing or a time, you know, where we're really experiencing the presence of God or, or when the church at large is. So there's a verse of scripture, Cameron, that we both thought was a good, you know, kind of standard for this idea of sustainability. And that's a very familiar verse of scripture to a lot of our listeners. That's Isaiah 40. And I think I'm just going to start with verse 29. It says, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What I love about this passage, Cameron, is it's basically talking about a form of spiritual discipline, waiting on the Lord. It's not saying they that go to revival, they that listen to their favorite teacher on podcast, they that have, you know, a week-long revival at their local church. It's they that wait on the Lord. This is, should be a daily practice. Uh, and I mean, all of us, I think, would admit, I'd be the first to be to admit that that's not always been a daily practice of mine. But even on my way to work this morning, you know, maybe I'm praying a little bit, waiting on the Lord, praying in the Spirit, whatever. But there's something about that daily practice that helps to keep us in touch with the source of all life and energy and strength, which is God, and and helps us to have some measure of sustainability, even if we're not on an emotional high. And I think we need to maybe establish that, first of all, Cameron, that what a lot of times people are talking about when they're talking about this kind of momentum, it's really a false momentum based on emotion rather than it is a, uh, a sustainable momentum based on discipline. And so maybe that's one of the things that should be brought out in all those. Yeah, um, I was actually just uh, making some notes as you were talking, because uh, some of the things you were saying were uh, just sparking some things. And uh, a couple notes I want to go back to. One of uh, when you're talking about how you're going to have two people go and do a meeting and one person says that it was literally answers to prayers that they've had. And the other person said, it's the same thing that pastor's been preaching on for the last like 10 weeks. <laughs> well, I think one thing is that hunger defines appetite and anyone who has ever done a fast or a diet or gone without eating for any length of time. Um, and I'm not just talking about like you missed breakfast. I'm talking about seriously go without eating. Um, Cause I've done multi-day fast. I'm sure as you have. And I mean, around day three is when your hunger hits that peak and all of a sudden you can smell food from like a mile out. And I'm not exaggerating. I remember one time I was in college and um, I was up at the main campus and on lower campus, um, a couple city blocks away was where the cafeteria was. And I looked to my friend as we got out of class way up on the other side and I was like, they're making fish at the cafeteria. And they're like, there's no way you know that. And I'm like, no, I can smell it. They're making fish. And sure enough, we got down there and they were making fish. <laughs> and it's because when your hunger gets exaggerated, our appetites get wetted. And the reality is when you go into a meeting, are you going in with a sense of hunger or a sense of apathy? Yeah. And I mean, I think that oftentimes, and I was thinking that about it as you're talking, and I think often we go through these cycles. In the past few weeks, we've kind of talked about this. We talked about balance. We talked about overload. Um, and we talked about how last week we, I mentioned aposia, which is when your body forgets how to thirst. And we had talked about the idea of spiritual aposia. And I think often there's this cycle, I would say, of um, unhealthy passion, where we start off... Um, getting very, very hungry, which is a good thing. Um, I mean, I'm still one of my favorite songs to this day that I sing often because you sing it growing up is Lord, I'm hungry for mighty move of God. Uh, pour out your uh, Lord, pour out your Holy Ghost. I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me because I'm hungry for a move of God. Yeah. And still, it's a great song. And I love singing that because it reminds me of how hungry I am to hear from God, to experience him, to partake in fellowship with him. So our hunger increases and it creates an appetite. Well, when we start getting that appetite, oftentimes we start going to things that are going to appease it. And if it's in a healthy way, we'll start reading, we'll start praying, we'll start spending time in worship. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden we get very, very full up. Well, what happens then? Well, normally one of two things. We either get so full and bloated that we get tired and we become like the Dead Sea, which if you guys don't know, the Dead Sea has a lot of inlets, but no outlets. And so it's so much nutrients just get 
poured and poured and poured and poured into it that there is no life sustainable in the Dead Sea. Right. You get all this nutrient rich soil and fertile like stuff in there. And oftentimes a lot of scrubs and bath stuff is made from it because it's so nutrient dense. But right. the issue is it chokes out all the life that lives there. And so right. it ends up being dead. And so you can fill yourself up to the point where you become bloated and useless. Or oftentimes, I guess there's three things. The next two are you pour out. Well, what happens there? You either pour out in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. And we kind of touched on this last week, how we often will just start pouring out and pouring out and pouring out, but then we forget to fill up. And so we spend our lives just draining ourselves of everything. And then we start becoming on overload because we become drained and dead to ourselves right. and we're just useless at that point because it's an unhealthy cycle of passion. We get so excited, fill up, and then finally get to the point where it's like, oh, I have to share with someone. And then we pour out everything and then we're at that dead part again. And we're like, oh, I'm just yeah. overloaded. And then eventually, by the grace of God, we get that tick back and we're like, oh, you know what? I'm getting hungry again. I don't want to learn again. And we get in this vicious cycle day in and day out. And I think, I mean, I'm saying this about myself. I'm too thick, apparently, to realize because as you were talking, I was realizing this. I'm now 27 years old, I think. I would have to ask my wife. I don't do a good job of keeping track of it. I normally turn to her and ask. I'm now 27 years old and I still do this to this day. I'll get excited, excited, learn, 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 get excited, pour out onto a bunch of people. And then I'm like, man, I'm so tired. I just don't want to do anything now. And it's like, if I were to maintain that healthy cycle of passion instead of this unhealthy cycle of passion, it'd be much more sustainable. But the reality is God knew we were going to get like this. Hence our key verse that young men will faint in exhaustion. We will get tired, but he is the one that we go to for our new strength and that sustainability. And I think oftentimes we need to understand that passion teeters back and forth, but we need discipline for it to remain. Yeah. You know, as, as funny as you're talking, I'm thinking about these four, um, I would say audio cassettes, but they, uh, cause I had them in cassette form at one time, but I have some MP3s of a fellow by the name of George Stormont, who was personal friends with Smith Wigglesworth. Um, he was 20 when Wigglesworth was, or he was 20 something when Wigglesworth was 80. So they had like a seven year relationship, knew him personally. Of course, he's passed on George Stormont, but I have these four MP3s where he talks about his personal, the life and ministry of Wigglesworth. And those who know of Smith Wigglesworth, many mighty miracles, uh, you know, didn't learn how to read till his wife taught him it. 23, I think, years of age, and never read anything but the Bible, didn't want to waste his ability to read on anything else. Um, God used him on every inhabited continent to bring revival, and, uh, you know, a little plumber from Yorkshire, whom God used to really turn the world upside down, and died in 1947, uh, 87 years of age. And I used to listen to those, Cameron, and other things like that, read books, uh, you know, Life Story of Lester Summerall, books about Catherine Kuhlman, Maria Wood, uh, Mariah Woodworth Etter, um, John G. Lake. And the thing is, these things will fire you up. But what made those people the people they are, are the spiritual disciplines they practice. So the problem is what we'll do is we'll read about people like that and get inspired, but without implementing the same disciplines, that fire comes in, that fire goes out. It's like a wind. It blows in, it blows out, but it doesn't, it's not sustainable. And so the problem is, is that we're trying to live on an emotional, we want an emotional gratification. And that's not what makes us grow. Um, you know, for example, growing up, what did we do to grow? We ate food, took in nourishment, and we exercised, we played, we ran. At no point was it like, did I let my emotions say, well, you know, I don't know, I just don't really feel like eating or playing. Today. I don't think I'll do those, you know, we just did it. It's just part of life, right? It, it wasn't even so much a discipline as it was just a cycle of life. We ate, we played. And of course, now kids don't play. They're in their devices and we have an epidemic of obesity. But but when we were kids, when I was a kid, for sure, and then you did too, because we would go play basketball. You know, there was this, you know, you just ate, you played, you just did what was organically natural to do and you grew, you developed. And, and then of course, we get more intentional as we age. Like I, right now I'm back to hit the weights hard and heavy, you know, 58 years of age. I'm trying to my goal is by 59 to be the strongest I've ever been. And I'm, I'm on track to do that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, these are disciplines that have to be, we have to be intentional about, especially the older we get. And likewise, I think spiritually, when we first come to the Lord, 
It's easy to say, read your Bible and pray. We're so excited. We're full of zeal. It's all new. It's a world of discovery. And we think we know so much because we're learning so much. But the fact of the matter is we don't really know anything. It's like Bible school. You go to Bible school and you get so, oh man, I'm just so full with the knowledge. Well, really you're not. It's just you're learning so much in such a short period of time. It feels like you are. You don't really know anything yet. Um, and until you put the rubber to the road and put those things into practice, you really don't. So anyway, all that to be said is that it's fine to be inspired as long as that inspiration follows a strategy of discipline to help facilitate the kind of growth that is exemplified by those very people we admire. And unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, and you know, when people are living in the midst of a movement, Cameron, they're not always saying, Hey, we're in the midst of a movement. They're, they're busy seeking God. They're, they're, they're about the work. They're not thinking about, Hey, I'm, I'm going to rewrite history. I'm going to be like my great hero. They're, they're too focused on, and a lot of times they're going through, you know, a lot of serious internal house cleaning. They're, they're going through repentance or they're going through, you know, you know what I'm saying? God is doing a deep work in them. And so they're not thinking at that moment we, you know, we look back in flashbacks, right? We, we have the advantage of time to look back at some of these great men and women of God or the Jesus movement of the seventies or whatever, and see the impact it's had historically. But when you're living it, you're not always conscious of that. You know, I look back now, Cameron, over my life, particularly in our traveling ministry and even some of the churches I've pastored early on, and I'll get reports from time to time. I'll get even emails from people that were in my original church thanking me for, you know, having invested in their life. But at that time, you're not thinking about what's the impact 20 years down the road or what, you know what I'm saying? You're just living it. You're in it. And I think, you know, life is every day. And, you know, you can't wait for these moments of motivation to come before you get busy for Jesus. You know, you you have to somehow employ these disciplines like getting into the Word. I think one of the biggest, and this is something I know you're really big on, Cameron, but I think one of the biggest aspects of this is having accountability through community. Because if you don't have community, you are simply not by yourself going to sustain momentum. You just won't. There's, I don't think it's possible. I, I, I just don't believe it's possible at all. Yeah. And I think, so I think, as you said, there's two things I want to touch on. And I think the, they are personal accountability and group accountability. And why, one of the things that I thought of when you were talking um, is because it's a story you've told me because you love this artist, Ed Sheeran. Um you were watching a documentary, I think, uh, I don't know if it was an auto documentary or just one about him, but he was talking about how in his life, someone told him like, what do you want to do? And he like pointed out a mentor of his and he said, well, find out what he did and do that. And so instead he found dad, out what that, yeah. Uh, oh, is his dad? His dad said, I think it was his dad. He said, find somebody you want to emulate and work twice as hard as they did. Yeah. And so oh, I thought you told him to work as hard as him. And then he decided to do twice as much. Um, Something like that. Yeah. But the reality is, like you mentioned earlier, we see these great men and women of the faith and have accomplished great things and we don't emulate the disciplines. But the reality is, if we're going to find a mentor, we need to find out the same things that they did. And uh, one of the people you mentioned was Catherine Coleman. And in an interview, she was being asked one time, uh, they asked her, what did it cost her to like pursue the call of God in her life? And Catherine Coleman in her grandiose way just was everything, darling, simply everything. And I love that line still. It's simply everything, darling. Like, what does it cost of us? Well, it's going to cost a lot, but it also requires a lot of discipline to sustain. And so you have your personal accountability because the reality is at the end of the day, if you can't maintain a passion, if you can't be disciplined yourself and have some sort of self-accountability, you're never going to be able to maintain it. Now, Am I saying that it's impossible? No, but I'm saying it's incredibly difficult if you're not self-sustaining. If you don't have a passion for it yourself, you're going to be trudging uphill every single day because no matter what, it's just going to be miserable. And second is you need group accountability because there are times, no matter how passionate you are about it, no matter how much you love it, no matter how great it is. I mean, even athletes, they they get paid millions of dollars to pursue their dreams, but so many of them end up depressed and discouraged because it becomes very real that it's a job at that point. When our passions become jobs, they become very frustrating and not as fulfilling as we once believed they were. And plus we can just get distracted by life and different things. And so we need other people to point us to our calling and our, the, 
And I mean, this is why companies create mission, vision, and value mm -hmm. statements so that anyone in the company can say, hey, is our mission really helping us like, right. or uh, is, yeah, is our mission really helping us accomplish our vision? Is our mission guiding us towards what our vision is? And are they in line, is our mission in line with our values? Is what we're doing to accomplish? Because let's say you want to become the best church in your town. And your mission to do that is by going out and evangelizing people every single Friday night. I'm throwing out a rough mission vision statement. Um, and you want to make sure that when you're out in that town, you're preaching grace and truth. And it's like, well, if you start lying to people to get them to come to your church, is your values really in line with your mission? No. Right. But if you start like trying to like condemn people and tell them that they're going to like turn or burn, is that <laughs> aligning with the idea of grace? No. And so you need to have group accounting to be like, well, here are our values. Here's our mission. Here's our vision. And we need to get them all in the same trajectory. And to do that on your own you can become very biased or you can fall to the wayside or maybe you just start having a rough time in your life and you need people to come alongside you and live life with you, lift you up, encourage you and don't have friends like Job. Um, I, I make that comment like very tongue in cheek as joking, but it's also very true. I think oftentimes in life, we pick the wrong people to be in our inner circle yeah. to encourage us. And oftentimes we pick people like Job's friends who have a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom, but they imply it in the worst way possible. Because I think that there is, like, if you read through the book of Job and you seriously sit down to read it and pick it apart, you realize his friends are offering good wisdom, good advice, good knowledge. They're not stupid in any way, but they're in the wrong circumstance. <laughs> And so you need people that are going to live life with you in that circumstance, know your heart, know your life, know what's going on, and be able to give you accountability in that time, in that place, with the right time, in the right place, and through God's perspective, not their own. Because that was the other issue, is that Job's friends were doing it all through their perspective and not through what God was seeing. Yeah. So just a couple of notes on accountability. <laughs> Yeah, for those that are joining us late, we're talking about this idea of sustainability. March was a time where everybody was talking about revival because of Asbury, uh, the revival going on in the university in Kentucky, and then also because of the Jesus Revolution movie, two great things that took place that motivated a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of people came to Christ during those seasons. And then now, like you said, Cameron, I'd even kind of forgot about that, even though I just bought the Jesus Revolution movie a while back, um, I kind of forgot about both those events. Um, but the question we're asking is how do we sustain that momentum? And, and one of the things I think we're saying is it depends on what you're calling momentum. If you're talking about in an emotional high, I don't consider that to be momentum. That's not a sustainable momentum. It doesn't mean we can't love Jesus and be excited every day, but if you're wanting some kind of high octane emotional experience every day, that's not realistic in any endeavor. Um, you know, like you, you used the analogy of marriage before we were talking about this, you know, you, you love your spouse, but that doesn't mean that every day you're, floating around the house, just, you know, oh, I'm just so in love. I have these feelings. That's not even realistic. You're looking for a partner to do life with, and life is tough. And some days there are arguments, and some days you have to negotiate what's the best between what you want to do and what I want to do. And it's work. And so is our relationship with God. And so it doesn't mean we can't be focused and have a clear mission. And I think what you said is very important. I think a lot of Christians are all dressed up and nowhere to go. They read their Bible, they pray, but they have no objective vision. So basically they're not, you know, it's like it's ready, fire, aim. They're not, they don't have anything to invest themselves into. So consequently, it's just kind of the sinless cycle of learning, learning, learning. And then they end up kind of squandering it all by arguing with people on Facebook instead of having a real tactical strategic idea of, you know, what has God called me to do? What am I about? You know, the Bible said that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So, you know, when you, sh I always tell people, when you got, when you showed up, when you got saved, God didn't have to stick you in heaven's unemployment line until he figured out what to do with you. He, he, the calling God are not only irrevocable, they're established from before the foundations of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that every step of your life is predetermined. It just means God gifted you in a certain way. And those gifts can be employed in so many different ways. And this is one of the things I was going to say, Cameron, is the church, if she's going to, if we're going to continue to be relevant, we're going to also have to learn to evolve because revival is going to look different in 21st century America. Now it's going to have the same results, people getting saved, discipled, the world coming to Christ, the great commission being fulfilled. But here we are sitting on, you know, YouTube, Facebook, that wasn't possible a decade ago. 
um, or, or, you know, maybe 15 years ago, whenever, I don't remember when these things came into existence, but what I'm saying is my generation didn't even, I mean, that would not have been on our radar because it didn't exist. We were dealing with a track and cassette, you know what I'm saying? So it's a completely different thing. So we have to learn to evolve. And I think one thing that keeps us young and keeps our motivation is staying on top of things. You know, you and I talk about this all the time that people fall behind because we're not staying current with what, you know, the way God's voice is being communicated and projected to this generation. And I think one of the things, you know, there's no room to really get lax or time to get lax. Um, life goes by like this, you know, I'm 58 yesterday. I was 20. That's how it feels. And every one of you that are in your twenties, one day you're going to turn around and you're going to say, Oh my God, that's not possible. Where did that white hair come from? And it's just a reality. Life goes by quickly and we don't want to miss out on God's call. So, you know, you can be gifted in a certain way, but like, for example, a communicator, you can do it from behind a pulpit or you can do it on Facebook, or you can do it through Skype crusades. We've done all the above, you know, you can, you can write, uh, publish magazine articles, books, you know, that's we're in media ministry. We've done all this kind of stuff. So the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, you need an objective. You need to know kind of what am I about? What am I made for so that I can begin to prepare and apply myself? Otherwise it's just kind of like, there's this nebulous, I'm just living this Christian life. And, you know, every day is kind of like same song, second verse, but there's no sense of objective, you know, where there's no vision, the people perish. The new King James says where there's no, um, prophetic vision, talking about a vision come from God, where there's no prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint. And so I think one of the things that helps to sustain mo momentum is when we understand something by way of clarity about what God has called us to do. And let me just say this, there's a difference between appreciating calling and being ambitious, because I think ambition is a, is a bad, could be a bad form. I don't think there's anything wrong with a pure form of ambition. I'm going to, I'm going to fulfill the call of God for my life. But what I mean, ambition is sometime the call of God becomes about us rather than about Christ and the objective to which he's called us. And I think we just have to keep a real clear distinction in our mind when we're talking about calling, that we're not talking about my calling, my, you know, you, you know what I mean? My kingdom, but really about how can I best serve the kingdom of heaven um, with the gifts and the calling and the time that I have, all that kind of stuff. I think it's important. And I think one of the things that you and I were discussing uh, beforehand, particularly, is that um, oftentimes when revival breaks out and when passions run high and like an evangelist comes in and um, does a beautiful job, a lot of times passion runs high, emotions run high. And so many people step forward to give their life to Christ, and then that commitment kind of dies there that day, because there's no sustainability in those revivals often. And that people will come forward, give their life to Christ, and then in the next day, the next week, what do we do? Well, did we connect him with a church? Did we connect him with a community? And I think that's one thing that uh, is really essential in that we take for granted in the Bible is that a lot of the places that went and shared the gospel and spoke into, they were community rich places. And we don't have that culture in uh, America that they did in the Bible, that there is a rich community sense. If they were bringing someone to Christ, they weren't dropping them off like the next day and be like, well, have a good day. Like, bye. Never see you again. Yeah. It was that they were going into a town and living amongst those people. And once a church got started, well, again, those towns were very community oriented. You saw those people regularly. They didn't get to fall by the wayside. And I think we need to make sure that, again, it's just a level of um, just a community accountability, a group accountability. Of We need to make sure that one of the things about being sustainable is that we're giving new believers, newcomers, the tools to be sustainable because yeah. – it's very easy, I think, in a moment of passion to make a decision. And I mean, what does everyone do at the end of the year? They make a New Year's resolution. Why? Because they get to the end of the year, passions run high, and they think, man, what have I done this year? Financially, what have I done? Physically, what have I done? Where am I? Everyone else is doing this. I saw everyone else do this. There's a new year, another year of my life come and gone. Another year of the world has passed. What have right. I done? And so passions run high. We make a decision. And then it's gone by the end of yeah. January, by the end of February, by the end of March. Um, and so I think one of the things that, especially when it comes to spiritually, we need to make sure we're giving people 
tools of sustainability, um, communities to which to be sustainable in. Um, if you're bringing someone to church or sharing the gospel with someone, their connection is you. But if you go and just to, to a random group of people share the gospel and they're like, yeah, I'm on fire. What do I do with it? And you were to just be like, well, say this prayer. And they're like, okay, you say that prayer and you leave them. They know nothing. They don't know that they should go to church or community plug in. So I think oftentimes one of the issues with sustainability is not equipping people with tools for them. Yeah. And I think this is a good time to say that if we call ourselves believers and we are not vitally connected to a local church, we're in disobedience. Now, this is something that I see a lot on Facebook. People make some comment about some church where there was scandal. And, and then you'll hear these people that have been hurt or wounded or or just trying to justify a lack of commitment. They'll say, yeah, you know, I'm not into organized religion. You know, I'm just a believer. I do my own thing with God. Like one preacher said, basically, you're saying I'm no good to anybody but myself, because what they're saying is I'm not invested. I'm not committed. I'm not using my gifts in a local fellowship to build up the body of Christ in a microcosm of the local of the universal church called the local church. And for people to say, oh, that's just your idea, brother. And you know, if you look at the New Testament, the Apostle Paul went around establishing local churches with leadership, with a hierarchy of leadership, because submission is part of development spiritually. So Paul talks about in the book of Hebrews also says about, you know, obey those who have the rule over you. That means there are people who spiritually have the rule over you. And so you cannot grow without having some submission to spiritual leadership. People that have been there, done that, are more mature. We you call them elders, pastors, whatever you want. But it needs to be somebody that has a recognized calling on their life. You need to be part of something that is structured and organized so that it provides accountability and growth. And if you're not putting yourself in a growth environment called the local church, you are number one in disobedience with God. And how far can we go for really disobeying God? You know, the Bible talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And somebody said, yeah, but Brother Randy, that could just be my weekly Bible study that meets at Denny's. No, really, it can't. Because though, if you're all believers, that's wonderful. Those things can supplement your time at church. But you need somebody who's called of God to teach you the Word of God, who has a gift of leadership a pastor. you got, you know, we say it sometimes, you know, traveling guys, I was a traveling guy for a while. We specialize in certain things. You may go all your life and never need a specialist, but everybody needs a family doctor. And that's what the pastor is. That's what a local pastor is. And we all need one. And so people can argue from now till Jesus comes, but when they stand before him, they'll find out, Hey, guess what? Brother Andy was right. You know, uncle Randy was, right. <laughs> You know, crazy Uncle Randy was right. I needed a local church because that was an environment in which I could submit myself and grow. I remember, you know, and, and I've seen, I know people in leadership in ministries today that are themselves not submitted to a local church anywhere. And I remember I wrote an article, actually, one one person who was on, in, in my town where I was pastoring, said, you know, I'm just not a part of any church here because they're not, spir basically, they're not spiritual enough for me. You know, they're dead. They're not dynamic. I'm thinking, we're having a move of God. Where are you? And they even visited our church one time. But it's easy to say that to justify your lack of commitment to a local fellowship. And I remember writing this essay called Words, Words, Words. If you ever find that essay, it was a direct response to the criticisms this person was levying against a local church to which they were not even committed. That's like me being an armchair quarterback when I don't have a 250-pound linebacker barreling down on me and I'm screaming at Tom Brady, well, can't you see that guy open over there? You know, it's easy from the cheap seats to criticize the people that are in the arena. You know, there's that great um, speech by Teddy Roosevelt about the man in the arena. And, and people that are, you know, committed to the local church, committed to building up the universal church through that local representation are the people that are making a difference for Christ in the world. Now, cer certainly, there are parachurch ministries that are doing great things for God, but they still need to be under authority. We need we need accountability. We need mentorship. Every pastor needs a pastor. So if we're, we're talking about sustainability without the local church, there is no sustainability of the purposes of God in the world in general, and there's no personal sustainability because all of us need to be part of a local church. I know that's going to be probably the spot where a lot of people start turning this off because it's not what they want to hear, and that's fine. But the fact of the matter is, Cameron, we you know, I know, we all know that we need accountability, and part of the way we get that is through the local fellowship, the local uh, assembly of believers. And I was going to say something else, but I got on my soapbox. And, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not, you know, I say, I, you know, I'm 
yeah, I pastor a, a, a church in my home. And then I have a, a, a church that I pastor Sunday mornings in Bakersfield, small congregation of elderly people now, to be honest with you. But, you know, it, it's a wonderful local fellowship environment. I pioneer churches, pastored many churches, and I've had the opportunity to see people come into these growth environments and grow and mature and become dynamic believers. But I can't think of anyone I know that has you know, intentionally avoided the house of God that has grown into an asset. Uh, instead, what they do is it, it all becomes about them and their ministry and my anointing. And it seems like those people are always shooting for positions of leadership, wanting to bypass the process. And, and that to me is not healthy sustainability. That's focusing too much on the individual. And I mean, and you mentioned earlier, you might have uh, at this moment, a lot of people clicking and getting on their keyboard to like ferociously <laughs> type something, but I, I'm just in the mood to make them all the more irritated. Um, Cause the reality <laughs> is if we want to be blunt and honest, and I feel like I can do this a lot easier since I'm not actually in like a, a pastoral world right now out of church. So, you know, I can't get in trouble. Um, but the reality is anyone who says that they don't go to a local church because they've been hurt is just, it's a load of crap. Um, I'm not saying that you weren't hurt. I'm, there's a good chance you were, you might've gone to a terrible church and it's a shame on them and the leadership that they, there are churches that allow significant hurts and injuries like that. But what I'm saying is your excuse to say that you don't go to church because of that reason is a load of crap. If you were in a work setting and something terrible happened to you, you had a terrible boss, a terrible coworker, and it made you quit your job, you wouldn't say, well, I'm never going to work another job in my life again because they hurt me. No, that's a load of crap because at some point you need to survive. So you see the practicality of needing to survive financially, but you don't see it spiritually. You need to survive just as much and thrive spiritually as you do financially and practically. And so there's a great importance on planting ourselves. And I mean, you, uh, I think you've written articles and had sermons called Potted, Not Planted. And it's mm -hmm. been a, a big key message. I've heard you preach many times. And it's very valid that if you're being potted and you're being transferred from church to church to church, you're never going to grow roots. You're never going to go grow past your limited framework because all of us, no matter how well intended we are, I mean, even if you're growing and learning and driven to learn and grow on your own, yeah, your pot might end up being like from this small to like one of those big like basin like pots that are massive, but you'll still be in a pot. At some point, you need to get planted in a church community. Why? Because like you mentioned earlier, you have a spiritual leader over you who has been gifted and called, and their whole job is to spend a lot of time each week in scripture and prayer to prepare you and get you ready to learn something new to challenge you. Second, you're in a community full of other like-minded believers of like faith that are hopefully in the healthy church desiring to grow and to expand their knowledge and understanding of Christ. And so that's going to transfer to you because if you only think the way you think, you're only ever going to think the way you think. You need right. other people to come and say, hey, I don't think that that's dumb. And it's like, well, if, and it offends you for a moment, but that's good because we challenge our presuppositions. I mean, I talked to, for those of you who think that we just have everything figured out right now, I called my dad. I texted him late last night because I've been studying a certain subject. I don't want to get into it right now, but I've been studying a certain subject. And literally to me at that moment, like earlier in the week, I was like, man, it feels like a foundation of what I believe is crumbling. Something I felt like I understood my whole life. And I remember I was having a conversation. I don't know if it was last night or the night before with God. And I was like, this little thing in my life, this belief I had about you feels like it's crumbling. And I'm like, but if it is not right, let it crumble, let it crash and fall because I want what I preach and declare from you to be truth and honesty and from a good and pure heart to be able to say, yes, that's what I believe. And that's what I know to be true because I've studied your scripture. So if it's wrong and I've just held this preconception because I heard it from other people, right. let it fall, let it crumble. And I would have never had that if it hadn't been for people in my life who have asked me, Hey, I have a counter opinion on this. And then I stumbled across a podcast that had a, that same counter opinion, but backed by tons of scripture. And I was like, Hmm, I better study. So you need to be planted in the local church around local believers 
And then three, when you're there, it's like, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the guy's name. Um, he was the, the workout guru, um, that made the whole statement. It's hard to do the wrong thing in the right environment. Yeah. Phillips, uh, Bill Phillips. It's yeah. Bill Phillips. The right thing in the wrong environment. It's hard to do the wrong thing in the right environment. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're surrounded by a pastor and believers that are well-intended in a healthy church and striving to grow and better their relationship with Christ, then by proxy, because you're in that environment and you're being influenced by the people you're around, because we talk about all the time, the way to change the way that you think is by changing what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, and who you hang out with. Well, if you plant yourself in the community, you're not only submitting to a leader there that's going to be looking out for your spiritual well-being, you're going to be surrounded by other people that care about your spiritual well-being, and you're going to be spending time hanging out with them. I mean, my wife and I spend time with lots of believers, whether it's playing volleyball or going out to dinner or going on date nights. But three, like I said, being in that community is going to start changing the way you think and act and behave in a positive way. Again, if you're in a healthy church, and so you need to be planted if you want to be sustainable, because while being in a potted plant for a little while might be helpful in certain things, eventually, you, if you want to have a rich, deep life, you need to be planted. Yeah, and let me let me just share a few things from what you're saying, too, because um, I, I just think they, they need to be said, first of all, there's not a single pastor who has pastored any significant length of time that has not been hurt by the local church. So sometimes we just think that the victims are the people in the pew. I am telling you from very firsthand experience that sometimes the people I've invested in the most have done the most damage to me. I remember when I was pastoring my first church in my 20s and got a phone call one day from a particular church member with whom I had spent more time than any other church member in my church easily kind of a high maintenance situation, you know, and because I had not been there for a day or two, whatever the situation was, I got chewed up one side and down the other. I literally was in tears when I hung up the phone. And, and you, you think of all the wonderful things you would love to say, and you don't, you swallow it because you're the bigger person, because this is what you do. This is, you know, what you signed up for. Um, another thing that's interesting to me, Cameron, is these people who want to have a platform and are bypassing the local church are bypassing the very thing that God said would equip us. The Bible said God gave these gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of service. So they're they're shooting their, their own selves in the foot by not being in an environment where, as you said, their assumptions can be challenged. One of the things that's interesting to me about ministry, people think they can launch into ministry without any formal preparation, where you would never think of a doctor doing that, or even a plumber doing that, or a mechanic. How many of us would go to a mechanic that never spent a day in mechanic school? And yet you got all these people that get so fired up about Jesus because they're falling in love with the Lord, and that's great, <clears throat> but they're not prepared. And I'm not talking to you about seminary either. I'm just talking about having God direct you in however he's going to prepare you for ministry, whether it's Bible college or mentorship or you know apprenticeship under a senior pastor, whatever the case, and then suddenly you're going to launch out there without anybody having ever really been a mentor or overseeing you or no accountability, and you're going to change the world for Christ? Probably not. Uh, what's more likely to happen is those people are going to crash on the rocks and take a lot of people with them. Because I'm telling you today, it's the easiest day in the world to have a platform. It's the easiest day in the world to get people following you, but it doesn't mean you're leading them in the right place. And so it's so important that we have people that we're accountable to so that we're not leading people astray because God forbid that we should become an impediment to the church of Jesus Christ. But one of the things you mentioned, Cameron, I want to share that story of the potted, not planted thing. Um, I didn't come up with that title, but it, it it was a perfect way to phrase what happened. When when Maria and I, my wife, were married in 2010, um, we were attending a certain church that she was struggling with, with and, and having a hard time growing in. And I won't go into all the reasons why, but there are very legitimate reasons why. Um, some of it just knew she knew too much behind the scenes stuff. And <clears throat> it was, it was impeding her ability to grow. I've been in this all my life. So I was praying and seeking the Lord about this. And as I'm seeking the Lord, I have a vision. Now, when I say a vision, I don't mean the heavens rolled back and angels were, you know, river dancing in front of me or anything like that. I mean, like in a flash faster than I can say, boo, 
I had this image come across my mind. And in this image, I saw, you know, in, in a church foyer, what's one of the most common things you see, you know, plants, right? You see kind of ficus plant or something like that. And it's in a, in a big pot. And I saw this plant in a pot and I knew it represented her. And, and I saw a hand lift that plant out of that pot and it was all root bound. In other words, the roots weren't going into the ground where it could get nourishment. It was in this pot isolated from whatever it could get nourishment in. And the Lord was showing me that's that's your wife. She's potted in she's potted, but not planted in this church. She's there, but her roots aren't going in down into anything that can provide any nourishment. And in this vision, I saw that hand lift that plant and put it in a field. The roots went down into the soil. All of a sudden the branches opened up and it bore fruit. And what the Lord was saying is you need to put her in a field. Right now she's potted, she's not in a field because she can't receive. This was not a healthy environment for her. So you know, here's a big piece of advice. Sometimes people are in the wrong church. Now, I hesitate to say that because sure enough, they're going to say, yeah, it's the church that's the problem. I'm going to go. And then they hop around for the rest of their lives, never committed. Um, if you've been to three or four churches and they're all, there's something wrong with all of them. Right. So anyway, get, get a good mirror. So anyway, the point is we did make an adjustment. We changed churches and actually God had already been dealing with me about another place to go. And it was the perfect move because number one, it was a very mature body that we went to, people very put together, well-established, long-existing church where I had a long-standing um, relationship with the senior pastor. They ended up supporting us in some of our ministry endeavors. Um, actually, I'm ordained through them too. So it, it was just the best move we could make. We had to drive further. We had to make some changes to do that. But it literally was, I think, the difference between life and death. Not, 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 not like that she would have died spiritually and walked away from God. But I mean, as far as her thriving, it was a huge, huge positive move. Now we didn't stay there forever because God had ministry assignments for us. But that's something that was significant: was understanding that not every church is for everybody. And it doesn't mean that that was a bad church. It was just not a great church for us. There's too much history, that kind of thing. So for us, it was the right move. No church is perfect. So every church has problems. So that, that doesn't mean it wasn't a good church for someone else, but it wasn't for us. And so I knew I could, I could work in either way. You know, I could, this church, that church, I'm going to be fine because I've been doing this all my life. I've got, you know, that kind of going for me. Whereas for her, it was more crucial that we be in the right environment. And it, it was really a big deal. So, you know, I think that this idea of sustainability, Cameron, it comes down to some of these things are pretty simple. You know, are you being faithful in a local church? Are you are you in, in in are you embracing the disciplines you need? One of the things that I see people doing today, Cameron, and especially with the proliferation of information that we have through social media, people are reading a lot of things that are very sensational, but they're not necessarily designed to get people rooted and grounded. And so, for example, a great example, uh, man, have you read that latest book on deliverance or? You know, and it's funny because, you know, you you have these people in the body of Christ, particularly the charismatic church, man, yeah, I just, you know, I we delivered this guy, and man, I had these devils delivered out of me, and I'm thinking, dear God, if, if you've got, you know, if you're a Christian, you're, you know, bragging about your devil problems, well, that that is a pretty good indicator there's a flesh problem, because that's where they get their inroads, right, and, and probably shouldn't be in ministry anyway. The fact of the matter is, a lot of people are going for the sensational and the spectacular rather than looking to be rooted and grounded and consistent because rooted grounded and consistent doesn't sound sexy <laughs> it's it's not the buzzwords right uh, it i'd rather you know deliverance gifts and hey nobody believes in the gifts of the holy ghost more than you and me right but at the same time you're not going to have a word of knowledge a word of wisdom a vision a dream a, an encounter like that with god every day you're just not you would have to add to the bible to say that these experiences were had by even some of the apostles more than once or twice in their life, right? So a lot of times we think we can live off these kind of mountain high experiences or have this kind of motivation going all the time. Um, and, and you'll even find, I have found, that some of the books that at one time motivated me, spoke to me, fed me, as I grow, I grow out of them. Not that they aren't good books and won't feed someone else, but it's kind of like going to your you know, my wife's a first grade teacher. If I were to go visit her at the school and sit down, or maybe even just go see an old teacher of mine, right, that taught fifth grade. Well, I go there and I listen to the lesson now. It doesn't feed me the way it fed me then, but I can still appreciate the fact that they're feeding fifth graders. And so we have to be ready to evolve and grow. And sometimes God will even bring different mentors and teachers into your life at different times to give you, to supplement for you what you don't have now. 
but you still got to get plugged in somewhere. You got to start, you got to be committed to something. And the local church is a great place to start. And then in addition to that, having your own, you know, friends and fellowship groups and, you know, have that weekly breakfast at Denny's where you talk about, or at Starbucks, where you talk about the word. It's wonderful. I love seeing those. I love seeing young teenagers, you know, getting around a Bible study thing at a coffee shop. I see that happen. I'm always encouraged. I always want to commend them. But it's so important that we be rooted and grounded. And some of these simple disciplines that, again, they're not the sexiest thing to talk about, but they're essential for sustainability. And I think those simple disciplines, like even the things we once learned, like you use example of like, go to your fifth grade, grade class again, it's not going to be something that's like exciting. It's not going to be something that's nourishing, but you might occasionally, if you were to go back to it, check in on, you'd be like, oh yeah, I forgot that rule and grammar exists. Right. So it's not, don't throw out your roots. Don't throw out the things that were once simple right. to begin with and don't despise the message that is on the basics. Sometimes the issue we have in the church is that we forget our roots and we forget our basics right. and we have to right. go back. Another thing I wanted to address is the idea of, uh, as you mentioned earlier, was strife in a church. And the reality is people get strife in church and they just get uncomfortable and they want to leave. The reality is you face strife in your family. You face strife in your marriage. You face strife in your relationships at work. You face strife everywhere else. But as soon as it comes to church, you're like, well, they're supposed to be Christians. I can't believe they, how are you acting in that moment? Are you acting like a Christian should act? Were you completely holy and blameless? Right. Well, if you were, then act like Jesus and work on it anyway. Like Jesus had to deal with sinful people all the time. And he dealt with them because he loved them. In a church, you're going to have strife. You're going to have, it's a family. And so, yeah, there's going to be strife. And on the same vein as it's a family, are you participating in that family? Right. Are you doing something to participate in your local church? Are you being an usher? Are you helping in sound? Are you helping clean the church? Are you trying to help evangelize? Are you trying to help in some ministry? We're not meant to be spectators, but participators in the call of God. And we all have a call regardless of, if it's a fivefold ministry or in the area of helps, God called us to participate in the Great Commission. And part of that is helping serve in the local church and being a part of that. And when you're there, are you contributing to the issues? Or are you helping resolve them? Um, I think it was John Maxwell that said, never uh, bring up a problem unless you can come up with three solutions. Mm -hmm. Are you the person that goes to, if you have your church holds meetings for like to discuss things or leader meetings, are you the one saying, no, that's not going to work to this? No, that's not going to work to this. Right. Are you saying, hey, that's a way to do it. Here's three other ways that I think it could be accomplished better. And I would be willing to help with that. I think, or if you hear someone gossiping, are you going up there and being like, oh, let me contribute with this. Let me tell you what I heard. Or are you being that person that's still like awkwardly even more sinners? They're, they're <laughs> gossiping, sinner. Like there's a way to be like, hey, you know what? This just isn't something I would like to participate in. I don't think it would honor God. Like I'll see myself out. It's okay. Like, and there's a way to do it to not sound high and mighty. Like, hmm, God would not approve. So I shall not approve. I shall move on. There's ways to do this in a natural way to better the family because we're not called to, again, condemn one another. We're called to call one another up. And people oftentimes, I think, don't like that in the church. They're like, well, you're judging me. Well, what is judgment but an assessment? I think there's a difference between judgment and condemnation. condemnation yeah. And oftentimes we conflate the two because it's like, judge not lest he be judged. And I'm like, okay, quote that in something else besides King James and let me know what the rest of it says. Yeah, exactly. It says to first deal with the issue in your own eyes so then you can help your friend. Yeah, and so right. if I have an accountability group and none of them ever say anything negative about if I'm doing something wrong. And I mean, we've had this conversation in my accountability group too, uh, and where we've been like relaxed and we're too loving. And I'm like, look, guys, if I'm doing something wrong, call me out on it. Yeah. And I have had my me members of my accountability group. I remember one time in college, very specifically, I'm not going to get into the details, <laughs> but I straight up lied to one of the members in my accountability group who caught me. And I tried to lie. And he's like, really, man, really? And I'm like, because the reality is we don't like being confronted. We don't like being caught in like our sin or doing something wrong. Right. And we try to weasel our way out. But accountability, if done well, that accountability partner didn't say, you know what? You lied to me. We are forever like enemies. I'm never talking. No, he loved me. And he was like, hey, man, I just love you and care about you. And I broke down in that moment because I'm like, man, I'm like trying to weasel my way out. And he just cares about my betterment. That's the same way God views us is that he cares about our betterment. Right. All this to say, 
These things are essential to staying long-term planted and sustained because we started this off talking about how there was this big push for revival and this, all this excitement and what happened. Well, the reality is revival and um, different moments of revolution, uh, as it was called the Jesus revolution, like these things can be spiritual highs, but you need a body, a church to sustain it. You need people that are in a healthy environment to be able to say, okay, we had this great moment. We went to summer camp. What are we going to do with it? How is this going to affect? affect your spiritual walk forever because i think oftentimes we get people so hyped up on the sugar and the candy and all the positive feelings but we don't establish roots in those moments or disciplines for them to take home with or community to stay connected with i mean think about when you go to a summer camp you go with all these kids that are excited learning about jesus and then you guys come back down and you don't have the same classes together you don't see each other again you just go your separate ways and all of that fizzles out if you develop a community that is good and healthy, you can move forward with these movements. I mean, one of the things that uh, I believe Billy Graham did um, is that whenever he would go somewhere, he would partner with the local churches, local churches, make sure that when he was done evangelizing, they had a place to connect into because very early on, he realized, hey, these people are getting saved, but what comes next? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I think you know, I, I was sharing with uh, someone I was talking to today, talking about some of the things we do broadcasting wise, you know, we used to do these Skype crusades. And the only reason we could really do those Skype crusades is because there was boots on the ground on the other end that were helping to go in there and establish Bible studies, churches, you know, th in other words, they're doing all the follow-up work. And that has been a historic problem with revivals. And we say revivals, even just evangelism events, is that people get saved and then they fall through the cracks. They don't get assigned to some local church or there's not follow up or whatever. And the fruit is lost. And it's just like, you know, um, we used to sing a song in the church. I grew up in bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And I don't know how old I was. I must've been a teenager singing that from the time I was two and realized one day, what the heck is a sheave? I don't know what a sheave. It was a bundle of wheat, right? That's bound up and brought in i don't know why i thought they were saying bring it in the sheep i don't know what i thought they were saying but i didn't know what a sheep was so anyway the idea that the the harvest is not just harvested it has to be bundled it has to be carried into the barn it has to be preserved and i think that that's part of the problem with a lot of these efforts is that they're they're noble <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry i've I'm lost you about it <laughs> these efforts are noble but they're not sustainable because there's not the infrastructure and again that's not a sexy word you know man i want evangel power evangelism well great okay so when they finally hit the ground right and then you know the miracle is over and everybody goes home it's kind of like i joke sometimes about you know the western where the guy kills the bad guy and goes off to the sunset with a leading lady on his horse behind him but then somebody wakes up the next morning with bad breath or whatever you know i'm just saying we never follow the story on and that's the thing is evangelism is a great end to a movie. Billy Graham's movies themselves always ended with some, a big evangelistic scene, right? Where he's preaching and the people would be saved. The family would come back together. But then what about the next day and the next day after that? And, and you know, the, the, the rest of life. So there has to be more of an intentionality. I, I spoke with you just before this. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but I've been working on a project in my mind. Um, it struck me because I shared at the beginning of this year, Cameron, when you and I were talking about our New Year's resolutions, that this was my year to get spiffy, SPF. And so I just kind of filled in with some vowels, but SPF spiritually, um, physically, and financially fit. And I realized here I am almost now halfway through the year, right? And had not been as intentional as I should have been on several fronts of that. And so I came up with an idea for, I don't know if it's going to be a website, a podcast, or if we're just going to like do a season of it on this or how we do it, how it'll happen. But I want to talk about this idea of becoming the best version of yourself. I'm saving the title for later, but, but I love the idea of having like a practical, let's go on this together kind of thing where we can kind of mine, what does it mean to become the best version of ourselves? Um, and and so I, I want to do this, and I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know if it's going to be pre-produced, you know, highly produced videos, or if it's going to be um, just podcast, or it's going to be a combination of all the above, maybe with a home website. Um, I don't know. I haven't, 
I, it's just a concept right now, but I think that people need something again, even if it's virtual community, something that they can connect with on a daily basis. You know, we, we want to run with people that are running and it, are they running in the right direction? You know, again, you'll never rise above your community. We rise or fall to the level of our associations. Friends are like elevators. They'll take you up or down. So we have to determine are we creating sustainable community? Are we creating disciplines within our lives? And who's accountable? Who's helping us stay accountable to that? So all these things, Cameron, when it comes to sustainability, I think are very important. And so, yes, we love the, the moments where there are seasons of refreshing, where there's divine outpouring. And we pray for those. We see God for those. But if all our life is only either living in one and waiting or waiting for one, we're missing a lot in between because all that stuff that happens in between is called life. And I think it's kind of like kids. It dawned on me, Cameron, Kids are into events. Adults learn to appreciate process. What does a kid get excited about? Summer, and then Christmas holiday, and then the vacation to Disneyland, and then when they can drive, and then when they can do this, when they can do, they're just living from event to event. But adults appreciate the necessity of getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and going to work every day and paying your bills. And it's boring, but it's what makes that kid even alive and in an environment where we can appreciate the various events. Because if there wasn't somebody paying attention to the process, the events would never ha happen. And so I think the same thing is true when it comes to the sustainability of spiritual life. Yes, it's wonderful that we have high moments, but we need to realize that those high moments are going to be surrounded by that thing called life, where we just have to live on live by faith, not by feeling, and be motivated by the end goal, which is, you know, helping Jesus fulfill his vision for the earth. And that is to make disciples of every nation. And, 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 you know, we're not going to win everybody, but we can win those, you know, that, that, that God gives us the opportunity to reach. And um, again, it has to be something in our life that's consistent. Um, it's not going to every day be a mountaintop jump up and down, boy, this is so exciting, but it can be, you know, I think the same thing is true. The difference between happiness and joy, Cameron, joy can be consistent, but joy isn't a feeling of, Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Joy is something far more, um, something that runs far deeper than that. That is the sustaining strength of the Christian. You know, the joy of the Lord, the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I think that, you know, a lot of Christians want Christianity just to be happy, happy, happy every day, a summer day. But the fact of the matter is true Christianity sustains you in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the downtime, in the midst of the challenge. Um, what do we do when our faith is really up against the wall, right? And if we've got the right sustainability built into our life, the right infrastructure, the right accountability, the right people surrounding us, the right habits, then we've got something that will go the distance and make it, you know, a difference in the world. I think similarly to what you're saying is that we need to learn to live life, not in the experience, but in the day to day and enjoy yeah. it at the same level. I mean, you look at whether it's Elijah or Moses, both of them had their mountaintop experiences, literally of encountering God on a mountaintop. And then both of them had to come down from that mountain and face some of their biggest opposition. Uh, Elijah, it was um, Jezebel threatening to murder him and he crumpled under it and ran. And Moses, he came down from the mountain to find the children of Israel creating a graven calf of made right. of gold and having an idol and forsaking Yahweh. And it's like, you literally both just had this mountaintop experience where God showed up and then you hit your valleys. But the reality is both of them ended up going again to a mountaintop. Moses went back up to the mountain. Elijah went back up to the mountain and had another experience with God. And right. our life is going to be filled with hard times. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that like the Bible said, like maybe it's before we were talking, I can't remember, but talking about how there will be trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. But the good news is take heart for he has overcome them. That's right. And oftentimes we forget. We're like, well, I live in a Christian like world. I'm protected by God. He's protecting me from everything. Well, the reality is we still live in the world that is sinful and broken. And so yeah. there is going to be trial. There is going to be tribulation. And we're going to have to go through those valleys. And we're going to have to remember in those times the disciplines that sustain us and that yep. he is our sustainer. So yeah. we need to go to those things. And I think oftentimes people are just looking for their next mountaintop experience. And if we always are looking, and we talked about this before, people are always in their seasons, either looking to their last season or their next season and just 
not taking advantage of what season they're in now. Um, again, I've used this uh, uh, story before, but when I was in high school, I was talking with one of my mentors and I just was telling them how I didn't feel like I was being very fruitful in the season I was in. Um, and he was like, you know, in some seasons, I feel I'm more fruitful in others. I feel like I'm learning. And he's like, the seasons allow me to prepare for the next ones. Right. So time, sometimes in the Valley, yeah, we're not having these mountaintop experiences where we're winning over the lost and having these dynamic movements and everything's hunky dory. Um, gosh, that's an old expression I get from you. Um, but everything's not going the way that we expected, but that's okay. It's a preparation season. It's a preparing season. It's a growing season. It's a stretching season. And I think so quickly people want to get out of the valley or they want to get out of the storm. And they, I've, I mean, I've been the same way and I've talked to so many people who are like, I just want to get through it. But the issue is, and I heard one minister say this one time, if you don't learn what you need to in that season, in that storm, you're going to end up right back in that same storm in that same valley, because we need to learn those lessons in life. We need to learn the things. If you were in first grade and you don't learn the lessons that you need in first grade, you're not going to pass and go to second. You're going to end up having to retake that whole thing. Sure. You might have the whole summer off and you're like, yeah, this is great. I have summer off again. But then when you go back to school, surprise, surprise, you're in first grade again. Right. There are seasons, trials, tribulations, moments in our lives that are very important for our testing and growth to learn in that moment and to prepare for the next thing. And no, they're not always the most fun. Nobody likes finals or exams unless you're a little kooky, but they're an opportunity to show what we've learned, to declare mm -hmm. what jesus has revealed to us and it's a great thing it's just not the sexy part of christianity right it's right. not the miracle moving moments that people want to make tv shows about movies about it's not the thing that everyone's like man how did you pass that test when you were <laughs> crying and wanting to give up hmm? yeah, yeah so don't I, don't yeah, discount i, I, I want to share something i get you know we're kind of at the end of our hour but i want to share a story that i think because we started off this broadcast, Cameron, with Isaiah 40 about weight on the Lord and that he's our strength. And I, there's a one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 27. And there's a verse in Psalm 27 that has always somehow meant way more to me than I can explain um, rationally. And it's verse eight. And it just simply says this, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord. I will seek this idea of this call and response of God calling us to him and us responding. I, I put that verse in the beginning of every journal that I ever make because it's a call and response. I'm not just journaling to hear myself. It's, it's, it's a response to my times with God, what I feel God is saying to me. And this verse became very real. Now that I, this verse has been real to me for a long, long time. And I know this verse very well. It's like always kind of close somewhere, you know, just beneath the surface of my consciousness when I'm, having these kinds of moments with the Lord. But I'll never forget, Cameron, I was sitting at this very desk. Um, it's been a couple of years ago now, but I was sitting at this very desk, having a moment with the Lord. And I remember just feeling frustration, inability, inadequacy for over a certain issue. And I said, Lord, and I just, I don't I can't remember if I said it out loud or if I just said it internally, but I might've even said it out loud, but I just said, can you just help me? And I heard the Lord say, I mean, as clear as I've ever heard him speak to me, can you come to me every day? And my, I literally said, yes, Lord, I can do that. Because I knew that was the answer. He was saying, in other words, if you'll come to me every day, if you'll put your, dep don't depend on you. If you'll come to me and draw on me every day, if you'll put your dependence upon me, then, you know, this is something that, uh oh, I just lost you, buddy. I don't know where you went, but I'm going to keep on going. Um, there you are. I'm coming back. I lost you for a moment. Sorry about that. I think my internet went down. Okay. It probably did. So anyway, I just said to the Lord, Lord, if, if, uh, can you just help me? And he said, can you come to me every day? And I said, yes, Lord, I can do that. And I knew what he was saying. He was saying, if you'll depend upon me, if you'll look to me, if you'll not rely upon your own strength, but come and draw on my resources every day at the throne of grace, I will help you. I'll help you overcome. I'll help you become the version of yourself that can overcome these kinds of issues. And I realized 
that conversation I had was just a rewording of this verse. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face I will seek. And that's what he said. Can you come to me every day? And I said, yes, Lord, I can do that. And literally my heart leapt just like this says, your face, Lord, I will seek. That was exactly what I said to him. It was like he took my favorite verse and just reworded it to me and asked me, will you seek my face? And my heart leapt and said, yes, Lord, your face I will seek in so many words. And so I, I, I think that's a great thing to leave to people, Cameron, is this idea that if we will just seek him, if we will come to him every day, now, I, I'm not saying you have to have an hour with the Lord every day. I think, again, get away from this legalism business. But if we will understand our dependency upon him and realize that our strength comes from him, we have this open invitation to come to the throne of grace whenever we want, every day. And I think it is obvious that just like we need food every day, we need air every moment, we need water to live, we need the Lord. And if we're going to sustain this thing and go the distance it's not just you know we're not going to just you know have catch on fire and burn up but if we're going to burn for the long haul and if we're going to finish our course as paul said with joy the way we're going to do that is by staying plugged into him i like what one person said deep roots into god not straws into everyone else and a lot of times we have straws in other people we're sucking life and no motivation out of them rather than having our own deep roots into god we're living vicariously off someone else's relationship with god instead of cultivating our own. And I think it's so important, Cameron, that we have that daily seeking his face, responding to his invitation to come to him. That can happen in our devotional times. That happens when we go to church. That happens when we create small community. But we need to have these occasions where we're continually connecting with him. And when we do, we can have sustainability in our walk with God. Absolutely. I had a thought, but uh, I think with the internet going out on me, I <laughs> forgot it. So that's all right. I, I think that's a great place to end. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and lead us in prayer then? Yeah. Lord, we thank you that you are the one that sustains, that you are the giver of life, and you are the one that when we are weary, we can run to, that we can put our hopes, our dreams, our tiredness, our frustrations on you, and you can bear them, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that we don't need to weigh ourselves down with condemnation or frustration about anything, but you can help instruct us in how to grow, how to learn, how to run this race well. Paul talked about that he ran this race and he had finished his course. And we thank you that you help us run our race well, and so that when we get to heaven, we hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, that we can run that race and be faithful throughout the entire, entire race, Lord. We thank you that you are just continuing to build community, develop our character, and help us reach more people for your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in and through our lives, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Again, if you haven't seen some of these, you can just scroll down my Facebook feed. They're all there. But you can also go to our YouTube channel, and the best way to find that probably, rather than give you the actual URL for the YouTube channel, is just go to randylanebunch.org. And then on the top menu there, you'll see one of the links is media. Click that, you'll see a drop down list and YouTube channels right there. So Randy Lane Bunch, my name, randylanebunch.org. And Cameron and I have what now, this is our 50th broadcast, hard to believe, but we've been doing this obviously for a year, a little more than a year because we've had some breaks. Um, but, you know, so there's a lot of resources there. And then I've got beyond that, I've got like 150 something broadcast also on that same feed so you can be listening for literally hours upon hours upon hours and um you know maybe you'll actually hear something that'll help you <laughs> so thanks for joining us tonight god bless you we'll see you next week and um hopefully minister some more things it'll be a blessing to you all right everybody god bless see you next time good night